Before we begin, a quick warning. This episode contains descriptions of violence and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. December 2nd of last year, around 3.30 p.m., in a wooded Fort Bragg training area just off Manchester Road, the bodies of 37-year-old Army Master Sergeant William J. Levine and 44-year-old Army veteran and former CW3 Timothy Dumas were discovered. The cause of death listed as multiple gunshot wounds. While CID investigators have managed to keep a tight lid on the details surrounding what they've ruled as a homicide, it was the details surrounding these men's lives that have brought much into question. Both of the victims had previous run-ins with the law. Dumas was scheduled to appear in a Forsyth County District Court on charges of breaking and entering, communicating threats, and impersonating a law enforcement official. And Levine was scheduled to appear in a Cumberland District Court on a charge of hit and run. But this story isn't just about two dead victims, but a story about three. A story that until now hasn't been told. This is a story of a suspicious murder investigation of a disappearing weapon, allegations of substance abuse, and of men bonded by war, pain, and ultimately death. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. This is Military Matters. This episode of Military Matters is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. Navy Federal puts members first by helping them save money, make money, and enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized around-the-clock service. On average, Navy Federal members earn and save $361 more per year. You can pay no fees, get low rates, and rate discounts. Plus, earn cash back and grow your savings. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information. Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. Last year could be argued was the year of the soldier, but not in the way we would like it to be. It was the year of the missing soldier, the dead soldier, the murdered soldier. It was a year that brought to light issues concerning the safety of garrison service members, the readiness of our military to investigate its crimes, and the birth of the hashtag I am Vanessa Guillen movement. It was a year that put a spotlight on the decision makers, accused of hiding truths and being forced to come to terms with the ugly side of military service. As 2020 came to a close, a final death of the year would send another ripple of shockwaves through the military. But this one was different. These deaths involved one of America's elite soldiers, a member of the U.S. Army Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, or as they're commonly known, Delta Force. Master Sergeant William J. Levine II, or as he's remembered by friends and family, Billy, was a combat veteran with multiple tours overseas, and by many accounts, a loving father and a loyal teammate. But William Levine's story doesn't exactly end in an isolated training site on Fort Bragg. That's because for the family of Special Forces soldier Mark Leshikar, the death of William Levine only brings up more questions about the man they refer to affectionately as Uncle Billy and the still unsolved death of Mark Leshikar. Jack Murphy takes us into the story of slain Special Forces Sergeant First Class Mark Leshikar, a death that continues to haunt this family and now looms over the deaths of Levine and Dumas. Mark Leshikar was born September 20th, 1984, in Elko, Nevada, to Danny and Cindy Leshikar. He spent his time growing up between Idaho and Missouri with his siblings. Well, he was my hero, for starters. I grew up very close with my siblings, and he was always my protector. That's Nicole Rick, Mark Leshikar's sister. My parents were separated and lived in different states, and so he was with me and my mom through a lot of it. So growing up, he was my protector. And then when 9-11 happened, that really hit him hard and it made him want to, you know, fight for our country. And he had so much patriotism and and duty and and love for his country and his family. Before Mark Leshikar would don the coveted Green Beret, he would wear Air Force Blue as a part of the Air Force Honor Guard on Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. After separating from the Air Force and joining the Washington National Guard, 
It was there that Leshikar would become interested in becoming a part of the U.S. Special Forces. But first he had to convince his future wife, Laura, that life in SF would be different than what she envisioned. Funny thing is, when me and Mark met, we hated each other with a passion. <laughs> That's Laura Leshikar, Mark's widow. He was just so pig-headed and, I guess, mean, arrogant. And I guess you just, you know, after hanging out with him a lot, we realized that we were alike. That's why we didn't get along. He's told me, he's told everybody that I'm the only girl that's ever challenged him. That's what made him fall for me. He decided he wanted to become a Green Beret. And I straight told him, okay, good luck. Bye. Not into the military life. My dad was a Marine. Not gonna, you know, live that life. And... He just, he was very convincing. He's like, you know, I mean, we get to travel, something that you've always wanted to do. You get your alone time because I'll, I'll always be deployed because I'm very independent. I, I love my alone time. So I guess he, to me, he had a pretty convincing argument. Despite her apprehensions to becoming a military wife, Laura settled into the role of being a Special Forces military spouse, a role that came with added responsibility of caring for her and Mark's daughter. I mean, it wasn't easy. I had to learn how to be, I guess, more independent. You know, now I had to not only make a decision for myself and my husband, I had a little one. I had to make the right decision or what I believed was the right decision for a little me and a little Mark. At first, it was, it was, it was hard because he was always deployed, taking care of a newborn baby without... I guess, always getting his opinion on what I should do because he's he could be on a mission. I can't just, hey, pick up your phone. Our daughter has this going on and I don't know what to do. It was hard, but I hate to say it, I loved it because it, it made me stronger, you know, and it made him trust in my judgment to take care of our baby. You know, it, made, it actually made us grow stronger, closer. Mark's deployments were tough for his family, but also tough for him physically. He had been injured and was receiving treatment for TBI, or traumatic brain injury. He had requested a desk job while he recovered, but also wanted to spend more time with his family. That family time would be spent in a apartment complex where other special operations soldiers resided. That's where he met William Billy Levine. We would have Taco Tuesdays, you know, Sunday dinners, and... Then Levine and his roommate just appeared at them, started coming over, having dinner or, you know, game nights or pool days with us. And we all just got along. I mean, he was going through, oh, I forgot what Delta calls them, but he was going through that training. Laura is referring to OTC or the operator's training course. Yes, OTC. Mm. You're correct. Yes. OTC. And the boys were going through SFQC at the same time. Him and his roommate was going to OTC. Mark and his brothers were going through SFQC. And so, you know, it was just a nice little community. SFQC is the Special Forces Qualification Course, a year and a half long basic training for Special Forces. Upon graduation, they donned their green berets and are assigned to one of the Special Forces groups. In Mark's case, that was 19th group. Levine let us know that, you know, he was in first group before, and he helped him out with uh, nav navigation, orienteering, you know, just the basics. Mark and Billy just clicked. They were so alike. They just got close real quick because they've come from a similar background, I would say. They always had a lot of things in common. They loved, loved, loved to hang out. I mean, whether it was drinking or going out or just hanging out and watching a movie or something, they were always, they were kind of inseparable for a while. Like I, I would joke around that, you know, maybe he, he married the wrong woman. He should have married Billy. In February of 2018, Mark's sister Nicole was moving to Virginia and in between closing on a new house, she lived with her brother, Mark, in Fayetteville for three weeks. That's when I met Billy. Nicole Rick. 
we had gone out to dinner. I met Billy's daughter and him and my niece are, were best friends. But he was, at that point, he had transitioned to more of a desk job, which I know he was kind of struggling with a little bit. He liked being downrange more than, than in a desk job, but he was so thankful to be able to just connect with his daughter and his wife and to be home for a while. Mark introduced Billy to his sister as his best friend. She would learn that despite their closeness, they were also quite competitive with each other. Nicole described their relationship like bickering brothers. That familiarity endeared her to Billy, and a connection grew. I personally have struggled um, probably with this part the most is because I connected with Billy quite a bit. Um, I felt a lot in common with him. I felt like he had more of a humanitarian heart, which is a little bit different than most of the guys that I met that came from the special forces community. Um, He seemed to be a little more tormented by a lot of the things that he was asked to do or had to do with his job. He, he was, I don't know, I always called it his, you know, when their demons took over with Mark, he was very much, he'd get a little bit more abrasive. You know, it was very, you could tell with him and with Billy, he would get really quiet. I felt, I felt like with him, he was battling a lot more mentally. You'd just see him kind of shut down a little bit and disconnect. And he was a lot more reserved when he got in those moments and it didn't come out. He was always very peaceful and and calm in comparison to my brother on the external but I, I always got the impression that he was much more tormented internally. So for that, I spent a lot of time talking to him because that's I have a very compassionate heart and I I could understand where where he was wanting, you know, wanting peace through the world and not sure how his job was contributing to that outcome that he was wanting. And I don't know, I felt like he was damaged and needed help, if that makes sense. As one of the army's most elite soldiers, Billy was both a highly trained professional, but also a man who seemed to Nicole to be struggling with war and his experiences in combat. I wanted to know if he'd ever talked openly about the things that were distressing him. Absolutely. I mean, it it came out more. The more he had drank, the more it would come out. The more sadness, the more pain that you would see. He held himself pretty well when he wasn't drinking. I wouldn't have really guessed. It was in the moments that we were at his house and had had a few to drink and and the conversations got started. You know, my brother would talk about certain things and it's like he almost seemed giddy and excited and that he missed the action. And when when Billy would talk about it, it was it was the opposite. He wanted to find a better way. He didn't like a lot of the things that he had to do for him. He's like, you know, it's not like we're fighting other soldiers that are in the gear that we're in. A lot of times it was civilians. There were there were kids, there were, and that really bothered him that there were so many casualties that, that for him, and he had explained one story that there was a little boy who, you know, he was so young that Billy was taken aback when he had a gun. And it was just like, he was forced into situations that he just, I don't feel like he ever rectified it himself. He couldn't rectify having to hurt an innocent child. The children part was the biggest thing to him. He said they were so young. There were eight, 10, 12 year olds with guns. And it was, you know, they started them really young. Um, And the other part was the way that they trained the dogs. There was, it was almost like a treat for them to, if there was a human to be able to, that's how he gave his dog a treat. And he could never separate the fact that that was another human. And I think for that is the part that ate him up the most is he really saw each 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 incident as humans, which I think a lot of soldiers learn to com- compartmentalize a little bit. It's not that they're not humans, but they're able to find a way to compartmentalize to where they don't take that into their soul the same way. And I felt like Billy was incapable of fully compartmentalizing that. Each time he was asked to do something or that it hit that level, it just added another piece of torment to his soul. Nicole could tell that Billy needed help. Billy knew he needed help. But despite the resources available to him, Billy was still afraid of getting that help. The environment of Delta Force is one of elite performance, a world where you can be removed from a team and sent somewhere else without so much as a thank you, much less an explanation. He'd invested his life in his profession, and he felt that a simple act of asking for help would endanger everything he'd worked for. He felt the system was very broken. He felt like the mental health community is so stigmatized, and especially in relation to the military community, 
that I don't even think that it's the guys could not get help at this point, but they've just been trained so long that they feel like they can't ask for help without risking their job, without risking their livelihood. And, you know, these guys do love what they do. They have a sense of duty and a sense of purpose and they love their country. And so the last thing they want is for a quote unquote weakness from them to prevent them from being able to do their job. And I think that that was a element of the military that Billy seemed to have a much bigger problem with. And I think Billy was much more, I want, you know, our soldiers need more. There's too much when they come back that they don't get a process in a way that, that actually helps them get through it because they're afraid of losing their jobs or being considered, you know, mentally unstable. I wanted to know if there had been warning signs of what was to come red flags that went unnoticed. I don't feel like he ever said it directly in those words, Mm -hmm. but he said that he felt like he could have more peace if things weren't so restrictive. So it was more that he talked about the restrictions and I could tell that he, that he never once to me said, I need this help or, you know, and so for me with everything that happened, it was a huge surprise because there were a few moments that my brother and Billy had gotten, you know, kind of started arguing a little bit and I was able to kind of be like, hey, I see both of your guys' sides. I think you're not really listening to each other. And I, I truly saw a brotherly love between them. It was, you know, I know that Billy loved my brother. And I think that's kind of been the hardest thing through all of this. When we come back from the break, Nicole and Laura take us into the event that changed everything when we return. If you're an active duty service member, veteran, DOD civilian, or military family member, you can join Navy Federal. That means if you served in any branch of the military, doesn't have to just be the Navy, could be the Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, or Coast Guard, you can join the Navy Federal Credit Union. On average, Navy Federal members earn and save $361 more per year. You could pay no fees, get low rates and rate discounts, plus earn cash back and grow your savings. Navy Federal puts members first by helping them save money, make money, and enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized around-the-clock service. Plus, now is a great time to join. Have a large credit card balance after the holidays? Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities. Make a plan to do away with high-interest credit card debt by transferring your balance to a Navy Federal Credit Card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org, Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. And now the fine print insured by NCUA dollar value of Navy Federal's 2019 member get back study 5.99 and 18% variable APR based on product type and credit where the nest up to $1 cash advance transaction fee at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Two weeks after Nicole moved out of her brother's apartment to complete her move to Virginia, Mark and Billy decided to go to Florida to visit Disneyland for Mark's daughter's fifth birthday. Both men's daughters and Mark's wife Laura went as well. Laura's family members flew in for the event, and it seemed like the perfect birthday vacation for a little girl, her family, and friends. On the return trip home, Laura split from Mark and Billy to drop some family members off at the airport in Raleigh, while Mark and Billy went to Savannah with their daughters before driving on to Fayetteville. During Laura's drive, she begins to receive strange text messages from Billy regarding Mark's behavior. And during this ride, I'm getting texts left and right from Billy saying that Mark's being paranoid. Mark's freaking out. Mark's saying that people are following us or listening into our conversations. And it didn't make sense to me. It was just weird. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, this and that. And I'm like, well, tell him knock it off. Because they used to do this kind of stuff, like pull pranks, like weird pranks on me. And so I wouldn't take them seriously at all. Laura wasn't sure if she was simply being pranked by Billy and Mark, but the text messages were strange enough that she decided to FaceTime with Mark. I knew Mark wanted to talk to the family to say bye, so I FaceTimed him. Like, hey, baby, you know, going to the airport, you guys on your way home, blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah. It's like, okay, how's the girls? And like, he showed me the girls. They're happy, having fun, singing. Hi, mommy. Um, we're on our way, blah, blah, blah. And I'm talking to him. My sister's talking to him. It's like, okay, well, we'll see. I'll I'll see you after I drop them. I'll come and get you and our daughter. And he was like, okay, we'll wait for you. We're we're going to Billy's house. And I'm thinking that's kind of weird. 
why wouldn't he go to our house? You know, because it's on our on your way home. Like you'll hit where we live before you hit where Billy lived. But okay, sure. Then I'll pick you up there. I asked Laura if Mark had seemed off or acting strange during their FaceTime conversation. He seemed like him. He seemed happy. You know, he was joking around with uh, the girls that we had with us, you know, our nieces. Like, bye, Uncle Mark. We love you. You know, I had so much fun. Thank you for spending so much time with us. You know, just the regular. Mark, Billy, and their daughters arrive at Billy's residence in Fayetteville. Meanwhile, on the way to Raleigh, Laura's car breaks down on the side of the highway. And then I get a weird call from Billy saying that Mark's worse. So what do you mean Mark's worse? So he's, he's fixing the car and he's being paranoid. I was like, something wrong with the car. He, he wouldn't answer me. But see, the thing is, to me, Billy sounded drunk. Like, inebriated like he was because he was slurring you know and mumbling and so most of the time i was like what what because i couldn't understand him he goes i was just deal with it and he hung up on me so i'm i call mark and he was like hey i'm just checking everything like okay you know and i'm letting him know hey i got stuck on the side of the road it's gonna be a minute you know i'm sorry kind of thing and he was like I'll come and get you I was like well no I don't want I, I don't want you to leave Billy with the girls he sounds drunk to me and he goes are you sure and I was like yeah I'll just I'll have our friend come and get me you know it's fine don't worry about it and he's like I'm sorry it's just the last time I heard his voice <laughs> He told me that, he's like, well, I love you, Missy. And I can't wait till you come back because we miss you. But I'll be right here waiting for you. Is it okay? I told him I loved him. And that's the last time I heard his voice. And that has been my guilt all this time because I didn't let him come and get me. Because I was terrified of leaving my daughter because I thought Billy was drunk. Should have just let him come and get me. What happens next is vigorously disputed by Mark's family. Billy's story would change several times and what is not factually disputed is that Billy discharged his 45 caliber pistol four times, hitting Mark with three shots, killing him. I mean, this was a couple of hours now, like... <sighs> around 4, 4.30ish, and I get a text from Billy <laughs> saying, I'm so sorry, sissy. I said, what do you mean? He just kept saying, I'm so sorry. And I'm trying to call and he doesn't pick up. So I call Mark and he doesn't pick up. So I'm like sitting in this car on the side of the road thinking what the heck is going on. So I call my friend and I said, change of plans. I got this weird text. I need to go check on my daughter. She says, okay, I'll head there. 20 minutes later, I get a call back. And she said, I don't know what's going on. I can't get into the street. And I was like, what do you mean? She says, it's blocked off. So I call her and she goes, I don't know how we're going to get you here. But you need to come back now. It's blocked off. So I'm calling and I'm calling and I start 
screaming because it's just weird. Before I got the text from Billy, it literally felt like everything was taken from me. Like my soul was ripped and I couldn't understand why. So when I got that text, I just started panicking and I started calling everybody. And every time they told me they were on their way or they were calling, and then I would call them back again. It's like everyone went dark. That's when Laura started calling Nicole. So this is where it's a little bit wonky because I I actually was pretty positive that my brother was dead before we actually got the official com- confirmation. That's Nicole Ricks, Mark's sister. Laura had called me. She was taking somebody back to the airport, I believe in Raleigh, and the car had broken down on the way. She had gotten a call from Billy that said that Mark was acting paranoid and erratic and she wasn't sure what was going on and she wanted me to try and get down there as fast as I could. My husband had the car at work, so I was unable to leave until he got home. And she asked me if I could start trying to call Jens and Mallory, which are two people that were there closer that Laura was having a hard time actually getting on the phone. Jens and Mallory were friends of Mark and Billy that lived nearby. Jens was a sergeant major in Delta Force. While waiting to be able to get a ride to Billy's house, Nicole noticed an alert from a local news site. At that point, there was already an article that stated somebody had been shot and killed, and I was told by Mallory that Billy had been taken down to the police station, so I knew it was my brother. Laura didn't know at this point. And I remember being dropped off. Well, we tried to go there, but everything was blocked off. So he took me home. My parents were home. And so was my friend. And I remember looking at my dad and he couldn't look at me. And I just blacked out. And the next thing I remember was my friend driving me to Billy's house. And some sheriff comes up to me and asks me who I was, and I gave him my ID. And that's when they told me, I'm sorry, but Mark was fatally shot. Because I remember seeing the corner van, and I just started screaming. And I blacked out. And the next thing I remember was one of our friends that we trust with our lives was carrying my daughter to me. And I just grabbed her. And that's all I remember. What transpired in the residence could only be discerned from what Billy Levine told law enforcement officers, a few statements made by Mark's daughter, and the physical evidence at the scene. There was some sort of argument at Billy's home. Mark and Billy got into a physical altercation, a sort of wrestling match out in the driveway. Billy then went inside and locked the door with Mark's daughter inside. Mark's daughter was scared about the way Uncle Billy was acting, so she unlocked the door for her father to come in. What happens next is still unclear, but according to a police report, a medical examiner's report, and an army report on the investigation into Mark's death, it says that Mark entered the residence and he was shot several times. Levine discharged his 45 caliber pistol four times, hitting Mark on his side, his upper neck, and a superficial wound passing from the back to the front across Leshikar's neck. Levine claims that Mark attacked him with a screwdriver, and that he was defending himself with a gun. But when the medical examiners rolled Mark's body over, they found nothing. Even after the police searched the premises, they didn't find any screwdriver near Mark when he died. They did find a screwdriver out in the garage, where Mark was working on his car. The screwdriver Levine claims that Mark had been wielding when he was shot was nowhere to be found. And then there's also the other physical evidence of the gunshots. 
There were bullet fragments underneath the carpet and one shot that passed from Mark's back to his front as a grazing wound on his neck, which implies that Levine shot him while he was incapacitated on the ground. An execution. Despite the odd and inconsistent evidence, the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department ruled that Mark's death was a justifiable homicide. It was at that point that Billy called Nicole, wanting to tell her his side of the story. So he walked me through from the night before. He said that the night before they were staying in Florida. I, I want to say it was Jacksonville, but I'm not positive um, where they had stayed. And that Mark had left that night, late that night, and didn't come back until the following morning. <clears throat> and that when he came back, he was not acting like himself. And he was really just paranoid and acting kind of irrationally. He thought somebody was watching him. Billy said that he just kind of had the girls ready. They were checking out of the hotel. He just kind of tried to get everybody in the car. And then on the way back, Mark continued to be paranoid. He was talking about people listening in and thought that Billy had something to do with any sort of surveillance that may be happening on Mark because he was Delta. And Billy had stated that Mark was going on about why he could never be Delta and that this was going to prevent him from becoming Delta. And, and that was where a lot of the paranoia Billy stated, which that was kind of the first red flag for me because my brother had always made it very clear to me that he didn't want to be Delta. Like he, he appreciated that their Delta force. It's a, you know, it's a big honor in a way, but the team mentality in the Green Berets is very different. He didn't want to lose that. His teammates were everything to him. So I found that a little bit odd, but and then he said they got back to the house and Mark started working on the car. He was still acting irrational. <clears throat> Billy was trying to help him look things up on the phone to show him that they were actual car parts and not any sort of recording device or anything of that nature. And then he said that him and Mark had gotten in an altercation outside and that they were wrestling, that they had, you know, tackled each other to the ground. They were you know they had started and at that point billy had the girls go inside and when he went inside he locked the door he said the girls must have been upstairs but that he had gone to make sh sure the back door was locked and the garage door was locked and he heard the girls coming down the stairs and opened the door and at that point mark came in with a screwdriver and came after him and that's when he had to shoot him he said I knew it wasn't your brother and he had to be put down. Those were his exact words. And saying that you have to put down your best friend, I don't know, it just, it was so impersonal and unhuman. And it just, that piece of it really bugged me how he worded that. There are many instances where Billy's story changes. Initially, he called his friend Jens and told him that Mark had killed himself. Yes. But if, when Jens told me that, he said that Billy changed that story very quickly mm -hmm. because Jens was already on his way there. Laura also got a different story. What I was told was what they got from everything, from Billy's statement, from the girls, what, what, the, what little they got from the girls at the time was that the two fought. Um, from our daughters, that they were just arguing from what she remembered. From what everyone was saying, when Billy, when all this happened, I know Billy would steal people's phones, like our friends' phones, and try and call me through them. Me thinking that they were calling to see if I was okay, you know, and it was actually him. He told me that Mark had a weapon and he was trying to kill the girls. That was the first story. And the second one was that he charged at me with a screwdriver. And that's the story I guess he stuck with because that's the story I've been reading. So Billy tells Jens one story, Laura another, and Nicole yet a third story. Laura also found out some strange news about her pistol, which had been in the car Mark and Billy drove home that day. After the incident, Laura wanted her pistol back and was told that it had been entered into evidence as it was not found in the car where it had been in a lockbox, but on the kitchen counter in Billy's home, taken apart. So someone had taken Laura's gun out of her car, into Billy's home, and disassembled it. I don't know if it was Mark. I don't know if it was Billy. Nothing was said about that. Billy claimed that Mark attacked him with a screwdriver, 
but no screwdriver was found anywhere near Mark's body. Billy also made no claim of removing that screwdriver. The only screwdriver that was found with Mark's prints was out by the car where he was working. And then we get to the part of the story where Billy says he could not see Mark's hands, which seems to contradict his original statement about seeing a screwdriver in Mark's hand that he was attacking him with. And that's all. that was all information that we had after I had spoken with Billy. And I'd also called Laura. The other thing that was really off about what he said is the fact that my brother wasn't there the night before. Laura had screenshots of Mark and the girls from when she was FaceTiming. And it was after the point that Billy said he was gone and there was no Billy in the room. So that part, I, and once I had had the conversation with Billy and then um, seen the reports for myself, my instinct was that maybe Billy was the one that was a little paranoid and he kind of inverted his role and Mark's role in the way he told me this story. According to police reports, Billy was never administered a toxicology screen. That's what we were told as well. That The Army came and got him before Cumberland County did that. From what Nicole learned, a member of Delta Force came and picked up Billy at the police station without him being charged for anything. After Cumberland County Sheriff's Office ruled the killing to be a justifiable homicide, Army Criminal Investigations Division, or CID, on Fort Bragg came to the same conclusion. But neither entity has been willing to release copies of their investigation. Cumberland County told me that they would not release theirs without a court order. Mark's family has used the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, to request the CID investigation, as did I, and we are still waiting for results. CID investigators were specifically told not to release their report to Mark's family, according to Nicole. The investigators also told them that Billy was going to be kicked out of the Army over other criminal charges. The truth is that he would continue to serve in the United States Army Special Operations Command. It was a huge shock for our family. Laura didn't even know he was back in the area. She had been told that he was not in Fayetteville, would not be in Fayetteville, that he was gone, that they had nothing to worry about. And so that's kind of what sparked it all because it was, I want to say Chancellor was the last name of the man that um, did the CID investigation and actually spoke with me and my mom. And he brought the reports and my mom FaceTimed us and he kind of walked through it all with us. And at that time, I mean, he, he made it clear that Billy was not losing his job because of what happened to Mark, because they did not have enough proof on those things, even there, though there was enough inconsistencies, there wasn't enough burden of proof for there to be anything moving forward on him regarding Mark. But that's when we were told about um, the harboring a felon that had happened just months after and that there had been drugs found in the house, heroin and fentanyl and a couple of other things. And and that that was going to be kind of the drug use and and that was going to be what pushed him out of the army and that they were going to be recommending him to be, you know, completely removed and he would be discharged from the army. It seems as if he got a different deal in the process. And my mom got an email because she she was pretty ticked when she found out Billy died and that he was still in. And so she reached out to ask about it. And he said that he was just as surprised as she was that he had recommended that. And it would have had to been the secretary of, of something higher up in the army that would have had the was the only one that had the ability to keep Billy in the service at that point. So what we have going on here so far is a lot of physical evidence at the scene of Mark Leshikar's death that seems to contradict the various stories that Billy Levine offered to law enforcement officers. And yet he was simply taken down to the station and picked up by a member of his unit without any charges being pressed. Master Sergeant Billy Levine and Timothy Dumas were found dead on Fort Bragg, North Carolina on December 2nd, 2020. Their deaths are being investigated as a homicide, according to Army CID, and that's as much as anyone is saying. Now Laura had to tell her daughter about what happened to Billy Levine, the man who killed her father, the man who she once knew as Uncle Billy. So I, uh, you know, broke the news to her about what happened with Billy and just her face. I knew everything was going to be better because I haven't seen that light in her face in a long time. 
And then a couple days ago, dropping my daughter to school, and we were talking about like how, you know, everyone's saying my daughter let him let Mark in, and that's when my daughter goes, "No, mom, I unlocked the door. Billy let him in." And we said, "What? What do you mean?" It's like, yeah, I heard Daddy screaming, so I went to the door and I unlocked it. Billy yelled at me, got the door, flew it open. Daddy ran in because he was angry. And then when I was gonna run up the stairs, I turned around and looked, and Billy was attached to the door, and it looked like he locked it. And I said, "What do you mean he was attached, baby?" And then she mimicked, like you know how the doors behind me. He was like this, and she pressed herself against the back seat. And then I s- remember looking at Daddy, and he looked like he was dancing. And then when I looked at Billy, his gun was like this. And then he shot. And I remember screaming and grabbing my god sister, and then turning around and looking and. He was just staring at Daddy on the floor, and then heard more bullets, more shots. The account from Mark's daughter corroborates the physical evidence and the medical examiner's report, supporting the theory that Mark had been laying on the ground when Levine shot him. And you know what's funny about that, Jack? I never knew this until about a month ago. I know I'd never saw any of those reports until it was on your article. Mark's daughter has also denied her father was ever brandishing a weapon. There was no weapon, none, even though people are adamant saying that he had a weapon. And then when we call them out on it, they'll be like, well, were you there? I'm like, well, were you? The only person that I absolutely trust in my entire life now is the only person that was there It's like, well, she could be lying. No. About this? What does she have to gain? She lost the most important person in her life. What else can you take away from her? Then come to find out the reason why she's speaking out is because she can, she says she can sleep at night because she won't, he won't take her mommy away. My daughter was terrified this whole time. Mark's daughter, an eyewitness to the tragedy that took her father, had been living in silent terror that someday Levine would come after her mother if she said anything. She was terrified that Uncle Billy was listening, the same Uncle Billy that she loved and trusted. Billy is her godfather. Billy is her godfather. So yeah, she's known him for all her life. She was confused thinking that Billy was daddy's brother. That's what she grew up knowing. I asked Nicole to describe her reaction to the news of Levine's death. I had a little bit different reaction than most of my family. I was actually disappointed and sad. I wanted justice to end up happening. My mom had been in contact with attorneys. We were hoping to find a way to go after him civilly. So I kind of felt like our path to justice had died with him. It wasn't until I spoke to my niece and how happy she was. And it wasn't even like happy that he was gone. It was a freedom. Now she, I mean, she talks about my brother every time I talk to her. She talks about what happened to him. For the last two years, she won't, wouldn't say much. Um, there was a lot of fear that escaped that we didn't even know she had just because Billy was alive. And so with that, I found a lot of peace. I'm thankful that she can finally process through things and move forward. And she feels safe. She feels like her mom's safe now. She's expressed since Billy died that now, you know, she doesn't have to be scared that he'll come and take her mom. Somehow through all of this, Nicole still sees the good in people and empathizes with Billy's plight. I believe that Mark and Billy both, they had good they had good hearts. They were good men that struggled 
you know, I saw a lot of goodness in Billy. I think that's been the hardest part for me to rectify through all of this is hating what he did to my family and my brother, but also having compassion for everything he was struggling with in himself. I don't know. I guess the darker side of me was thankful he had to live with what he did. And I have enough faith to know that he's at peace now. And that part I was a little more angry about. I wanted him to have to live with what he did to Mark, knowing how much he loved my brother. I knew he was tormented by it. And I kind of had a little bit of peace in that, which I know isn't the, isn't the nicest thing, but so I had to, I had to kind of work through that, not being angry that he had an easy out in a sense, but also the more that's, that's come out um, surrounding his death as I've been watching what's coming out about it. It's, further proof of how tormented he was to me. Even the end of his life, I don't believe anybody deserves to be stripped of their dignity the way he was. I wanted to know what Nicole thought about the entire situation, the circumstances behind her brother's death. What did she think this was really about? Well, from everything that I've deduced, I've it sounds like there were it was drugs involved. It from what I was told, he was killed before they got to where they were, where they were found, and that that Timothy was also involved in drugs. It's made me wonder if maybe why he was granted maybe leniency from higher up was because he had information regarding a lot of those activities. And I'm wondering if his death maybe has to do with the fact that somebody found out that he could have been working with people higher up. And I have no, no way to like, prove that obviously but um the I, i've had a few people reach out just because of my comments online that were close with billy one in particular had reached out to my mom and she had spent a lot of time with billy in the months before he died and she had actually been with him he got a tattoo on his chest that has my brother's initials and the death date and so we found out that he he got a tattoo of two thor hammers my brother was really into norse mythology and it said, until we meet in Bahala, and it had my birth date and his initials. And that to me was a sign of remorse. And she said that she talked, that when he talked to her about the situation with Mark, that they, he never gave her a lot of detail, just that he murdered his best friend. And he used the word murdered when he spoke to her. I feel like it was kind of a culmination of all of his tragedy and struggling and suffering in his own head, not only for what he had experienced overseas, but what that had led him to experience in life. Everything that happened with Mark, losing his daughter and his wife. And I think that either he got too deep into everything or he was trying to maybe, maybe that, you know, by working with them and trying to come to the bottom of all of this, he felt like he could have, I don't know, made up for some of his sins <laughs> by trying to help the military. That's kind of my impression of it all, is either he was nefariously involved in drugs and got way too deep and got killed for that, or he was trying to come out of it and do the right thing and was killed for that. I kind of feel like it's one or the other. I asked Nicole why she thought Mark was killed that day. Now that I've seen everything surrounding Billy's death, I truly believe that Mark may have realized or something had come up in their drive where maybe Billy mentioned the heroin because my my family has struggled with we've we've had a family member that has struggled pretty severely with opiate addiction and that's something that even with the tramadol mark was really he was starting to connect more on that and he was very against heroin he was very against opiates and what it was doing to our country and now seeing where Billy's path took him I feel like maybe my brother was trying to help him as you know mark's sister where i said you know he was never as delicate with me as he was his daughter you know he wanted me to be tough and strong i mean that's the way he would have approached one of his brothers it wouldn't have been a nice you know oh man we really need to you know i want to help you i mean it would have been like a what the hell are you doing you know like it, it would have been a more aggressive like come on man this isn't you know this isn't where you want to be and now that I've seen everything come out, I think that's probably most likely what started whatever altercation happened. And that maybe Billy was the one that got paranoid in that, that maybe Mark would go to superiors or there was some sort of, because they were both in special forces, even though they were in different units. I think that it may have triggered more of a fear in Billy and that's what instigated everything that happened. Initially, I just thought that 
it was just their demons coming out in a way that I couldn't understand. There's so much about the special forces community and what they go through that I can't wrap my hand around that nobody who has not been in war and not had to experience the things they've experienced. We can't understand how that would impact your brain. And so I had chalked it up to that until Billy died. And I've really seen just the timeline of everything. I, I now truly believe in my heart that Mark was trying to get him off of that path. And Billy got scared and thought he would go about it the wrong way and felt like he had to protect himself and silence my brother. For Nicole, what happens to Billy and her brother is not just the story of two soldiers or two best friends and their families. It is a story about the United States military and the social repercussions of two decades of nonstop war. It's a story about the systems failing, secret deals to keep the integrity of organizations, and what happens when our elite can't find help. We can't bring my brother back, but for me, this entire story where its purpose lies is in bringing awareness to the special forces community, bringing awareness to what these guys go through and and how they do feel like they can't get the help that they need, that they can't ask for it, or they can, you know, be punished or potentially be, you know, restricted from certain duties or things that they really, I mean, that that's what drives them. They just want to serve. I, I mean, these guys that are in the elite, I mean, they, they're tough, they're tough and they have a different level of determination and it is their life. It is what they want to do. And I think that this tragic story shows two men that were really struggling with a lot of different things. They were both struggling with levels of addiction. They had both suffered traumas while overseas. And unfortunately, our military tends to take better care of the machinery that comes back than the men. I think that if this story can bring awareness and more people in the country can advocate for the right type of help and we can find the balance, you know, of taking care of mental health and, and not having the risks of, you know, certain medications and things like that. There's lines that have been drawn for a reason, but I think there's a lot of gray area that needs to be addressed in order for these guys to get the help they need. And that ultimately is why I want to keep sharing Mark's story. I can't save him, but there's other men that can be saved if these problems are addressed and solved. One of the victims of the terrible crime that claimed Mark Leshikar's life was his daughter. She witnessed everything, has lived in fear, and is only now opening up about what really happened. Her road to healing has been difficult, but she's getting there. My daughter's been taking... She's been doing what they call equestrian therapy. She goes and she grooms horses and helps around the farm. And we've noticed that actually helps her because if she can't talk to me or someone that she doesn't feel like she can trust, I'll hear her talking to the horses about what happened. I lost my dad. If there's anything I love more than you, it's my dad. The events surrounding the death of Mark Leshikar are disturbing, to say the least. But I'm going to be honest, I've covered enough events in the military that are similar to this, to the point that I've become somewhat jaded. The military has a habit of moving problems around the force rather than decisively engaging with them. The army will move these problem children around from one position to the next, the same way the Catholic Church has been caught moving around pedophile priests, hoping that the problem just goes away without anyone having to take responsibility for them. The mechanics of Mark's death, the timeline, the physical evidence, the lack of accountability follow a trend, a template that is all too familiar. Maybe the real story here is that 20 years of war have had an impact on America's elite soldiers. No less than General Votel went in front of Congress and said that we are mortgaging our future and eating our young. Never before have I heard the mental and emotional costs laid out as candidly as Laura and Nicole describe. The real story is that time is a flat circle, that this isn't the only murder in a lonely cement cul-de-sac in Fayetteville. Not long after 9-11, there was a string of Special Forces soldiers murdering their wives, including one Delta Force operator who killed his wife and then himself. Last month, a soldier on Fort Bragg named Keith Lewis shot and killed his pregnant wife before killing himself, 
leaving behind a three-year-old daughter in the house. That's what this story is really about. Not just Mark Leshikar, Billy Levine, but about children like their daughters and the other daughters on military bases who keep having these events happen to them over and over and over again. No matter if you're an E-1 supply clerk or a master sergeant in Delta, if you need help, please call the National Suicide Hotline. I know it says suicide, and maybe you're not quite thinking about that specifically, but you know you need some type of help. Give them a call, and I promise you, they'll help. The Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you and your loved ones. Call 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. This episode was written and produced by Jack Murphy and Rod Rodriguez. Additional editing and sound design by Clear Comma Studios. Executive produced by Joe Fleming. Jack Murphy's original article that inspired this episode was originally published at ConnectingVets.com. A link to this article is in the show notes. Make a plan to do away with high-interest credit card debt by transferring your balance to a Navy Federal Credit Union credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org, Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. Leave us a review and a five-star rating on whatever podcast player you use. Those reviews really do help us reach a new audience. And be sure to share this podcast. We grow through word of mouth. You can find Military Matters everywhere you listen to podcasts or go to stripes.com and click on the podcast tab. We're always free to listen to. Use promo code podcast and save 50% on your digital subscription to Stars and Stripes. You can follow us on Twitter. Jack Murphy is at Jack Murphy RGR and Rod Rodriguez is at Rod Pod Rod. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. We'll see you at the next episode.